know, so a little bit about my background just uh, <coughs> uh, to, to help folks out. So I've been doing private equity investing and venture capital investing since 1997. So I've invested in 22 companies, <coughs> uh, 13 went public or got bought. I invested about $350 million and returned about a billion. Um, I've also co-founded uh, three internet businesses. And um, one business was a company called Virgin, which was in the local uh, uh, retail, uh, local luxury services space that um, we launched in March of 2010 in San Francisco. And then we were acquired by Guild Group in October of 2010. So we were in business for, for seven months, and it was a pretty neat, exciting uh, uh, kind of process. So as all of this uh, uh, occurred, I learned that you know things move really fast now in this day and age. And the companies that really focus on analytics and customer lifetime value and even economics are ones that can go massively and scale very quickly. So with that, I'd love to do the slide. <coughs> One of the um, things that's going on in the private equity industry today is there are about 2,000 firms out there right now. And of the 2,000 firms, very few have significant or traditional improvement to show for it. I think I lost the uh, Sorry. Let me, let me put that on my side. We, 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 we uh, reinitialize every time. No, I, can, I think I can get going and okay, see good. where we go. Um, so there are about 2,000 private equity firms in the, in the industry today. And um, very few of them have a differentiated approach to how they invest. I think some of them invest differently across asset classes. Some di invest across um, uh, technology uh, te sectors. So you'll have a technology or a buyout firm and things like that. <coughs> The problem is most of these firms rely on very antiquated methods of valuation. And uh, EBITDA has been around since probably the 40s or 50s. <coughs> People are still using that as a fundamental valuation method um, to value companies. And I would argue uh, it's, uh, uh, I would argue that it's not, particularly in this day and age, as companies are growing so quickly, it's not a good way to, to, to value companies. Okay. So, Hi. thank you. So, the first slide, I, Moneyball has, has been a really interesting example for me. And I think a lot of what is going on in the industry today is very analogous to Moneyball, right? Folks are using EBITDA multiples. <coughs> Folks are really thinking about businesses like okay, is this a 10 times EBITDA business or is this an eight times EBITDA business? Really going on gut and intuition and things like that. Um, and I see this as a massive problem in the industry. Uh, and I think, you know, what this has caused companies and private equity firms to do is really mismanage how they think about value and how they think about their businesses. So if I look at EBITDA in particular, EBITDA could be highly manipulated, right? You can meter EBITDA between um, growth and profitability. <coughs> and essentially, in, in the throttle is marketing, right? If you pull, if you step on the gas on marketing, your profitability goes down, but you grow a lot faster. <coughs> Similarly, if you let off the gas on marketing, your, profit, your growth goes down, but your profitability goes up. So there's a really significant um, correlation between the two. 
so if EBITDA isn't really a good metric to value a company, can we come up with something better? And you know, one of the things that, that I've been working with, with, with Pete Fader and a few others, is I think there's a better way of doing that. <coughs> so <coughs> in Moneyball, you really cared about one metric, right? That was the on-base percentage. Wait, quick show of hands, who's seen the movie? Okay, good, so at least I'm, uh, most people are getting the analogy. Um, basically in the movie, they only cared about one metric, right? Does this guy get on base? And that getting on base gets the run, uh, the hits, the wins, and, and, and you, you win the, uh, the World Series. Um, so can we hang our hat on one metric that uh, is a substitute for EBITDA that, uh, that we can start as a building block for things going forward? So I give you uh, two examples of businesses, right? These are two of my portfolio companies. Um, and as an example, Think Finance, I invested in that company in 2005. Um, I led a $33 million <coughs> investment um, and uh, was on the board of directors there. Um, and in 2005, it did $35 million in revenue. And in 2012, it did over $500. Um, and I look at it as uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a success on many fronts, but it's also um, number two on the Forbes list of most promising companies um, in the country. Uh, they do consumer loans and they have a consumer loan product. Um, the second company is another investment of mine, and I led a $30 million investment in 2007 in a company called Intelligent Beauty. It was doing about $15 million in revenue back then, and then last year did about 450. Now, um, Intelligent Beauty is a, is a pretty interesting company. They started by making their own beauty supplies and selling them online. And that was one line of business. The second was um, they have a weight loss product called Sensa, which you sprinkle on your food and it, it makes you um, think you've eaten more than you did. And it works by, <laughs> it works with your olfactory system and it says, you know, there are certain smells that make you feel full. So these make your food somewhat smell like the full smelling uh, stuff. And then the third product, they have a product called Get Fabulous, which is a, a shoe product. Um, it's, it's basically a competitor to, to uh, Shoe Dazzle, which is a kind of a shoe of the month club. But what I realized is both of these companies focus on one metric, and that's all <coughs> they cared about. And that was customer lifetime value. Um, and, you know, as being Wharton students, everything, customer lifetime value is the projection of profit <coughs> on a unit basis and, and kind, of, kind of attributed to the life of that of that customer. And with CLV as a building block of value, um, if you get the unit economics right, you can grow massively and profitably very quickly. And so that's what these two companies did. All they cared about every day, customer lifetime value. It, are my unit economics such that if I require a customer, I'm making a lot of money on that customer? And where do I get those customers so I grow a lot faster? So. What does this mean um, for marketers? Uh, what this building block allows companies to do is that on a granular level, it, it lets you know how much each customer's worth. <coughs> and then you can figure out how profitable they are or not, and then you back up the truck and get more of the profitable ones. You can also use this data in aggregate to figure out and project growth. So as, a, as an example, the way a lot of my companies look at things is very um, simplistically to the extent that, okay, look, if a customer is bringing me in $100 in revenue, right, and it costs me $40 in cost of goods sold and services to support that customer over their lifetime, right? So $100 in, in total revenue, $40 in, in costs and services, my customer lifetime value is 60 bucks. At the end of the day, a good company makes about two times ROI on their marketing dollars. So if you were to acquire that company, uh, that customer <coughs> for $30 through your various marketing channels, whether it be email or direct mail or, or TV or anything like that, if you acquire them for $30 and they're worth $60 to you, 
great. That's a pretty good business. Um, as an example, the company that we had that we sold to Guild Group, our uh, customer lifetime value was about sixty-four dollars, and we were acquiring for acquiring them for two dollars. So we were doing a thirty x um, ROI <coughs> market. Uh, that's a little bit of a rarity, but the higher the multiple, obviously, the better that your your investment dollars are worth um, for the comp uh, for the customers. <coughs> And I think one of the interesting things about this and, and looking at customer lifetime value is that EBITDA has nothing to do with it, right? If you were to get your, your channels right and you, um, you wanted to grow quicker, all you would do is figure out which are your most profitable channels and then you know, spend every single dollar you have in order to drive that growth. And I think that's one of the interesting things that private equity folks now don't really see is that, okay, I care about EBITDA, and EBITDA, I'm going to do a multiple on EBITDA. That really doesn't take into account how quickly you're growing or what kind of customer, customer base you have. This kind of has a, a different approach to it. So <coughs> once you have kind of the initial unit economics figured out, um, the goal is to build in additional growth. And this could be done in the form of additional revenue streams um, and trying to monetize that customer base better. So um, as an example, Guilt Group, and quick show of hands, does, do people know Guilt Group? Okay. Um, so they started out in women's fashion, and they realized, okay, I'm spending a lot of money to get subscribers to our email list. So what can I do? What other things can I sell them? in order to um, uh, take advantage and amortize those customer acquisition costs. So they went from women's to men's to kids to services to, um, to travel. Our business was the, um, the business that they acquired was um, the local services business within Guilt. So our product, our, our company became Guilt City within Guilt. Um, so let's see. Another thing to think about with, um, with business <coughs> models and how you maximize CLV is there's a significant trend into kind of one-off e-commerce businesses. So companies that sell, you know, one transaction, you know, I'll sell you that watch and then you, can, you, don't, you generally don't come back to ones that are more on a continuity business. And continuity business models are something that um, is, is, is very uh, interesting now and a lot of folks are excited about it. Um, and as an example, the intelligent beauty business was really around uh, a continuity business model. So these were acquiring subscribers and then kind of of the month club selling them more stuff every month. Um, and this is really helpful in terms of being able to <coughs> predict revenue, um, predict profitability, and helps you figure out what your customer lifetime value ultimately is and get a better sense of handle on that. Um, and if you take the <coughs> class, you'll be able to see, okay, some companies are contractual and some are non-contractual. This would fall in the contractual category. And it does, it, this it really helps drive um, additional revenue streams. Um, similarly to the revenue side, once you have that figured out, you can then optimize by cost. So then you can look at activity-based costing. You can look at all the unit economics associated <coughs> with supporting each of these um, these customers, and that actually helps drive profitability. So kind of the two in tandem, um, I believe, really help iron down what your unit economics are, and once those unit economics are figured out, um, uh, you can really grow a company significantly. And the interesting thing about it is it's not static. So you really have to keep on uh, optimizing the whole process. If you don't, you kind of uh, you get stuck, and oftentimes your marketing channels will dry up or become more expensive. Then you have to find different channels in order to make those um, uh, to make up for those customers. So, one of the things about CLV is a, it's a continuous process. You're always driving to make a more optimized business model. So, I think those are one of the things that are um, that are pretty, pretty, um, particularly interesting. So this has a number of implications for investors, and um, 
as I look at how this works, um, optimizing uh, CLV is a, is a very different way of looking at it. And you know, we'll see if it, if it, how it gains traction over time. But most folks really spend too much time valuing businesses on DCFs or comps and a lot of things that are um, uh, reliant on a lot of intangibles. Um, and they're fundamentally ignoring the, the value of a customer in an investment. Um, so what, what CLV is <coughs> able to give you, let you do is predict the value of your current customers as well as what the future value is of those um, customers yet to be acquired. And this would give you a better sense for how much this company should be worth. So my wife thinks I'm a complete nerd, but this is my favorite board slide. And I would say I make every company I invest in or work with do it. And essentially it's cohort analysis. And is this something that folks are familiar with here or is this something that I can go through a little bit deeper? I can go through it. You go through it? So essentially, uh, <coughs> it's funny that it gets me excited. Um, so looking at this, basically over time, each cohort, so each, um, each cohort is represented by a line, right? And the, what, what this is saying is that each subsequent cohort is getting more and more profitable. So if I look at the customer lifetime value, this shows that over time, each successive cohort is actually trending on a higher level. So for me, as an investor, I want to see this every single time. Right? Because this will tell me really quickly, if I see this, for example, this purple cohort, if I see it going like this, I know I'm in trouble, right? Or something is wrong with that business. Or something is wrong with that cohort. So <coughs> something, you know, whether they're starting to be too expensive to maintain, something is, something's off, right? If everything comes out nicely like this, where, you know, every successive um, a group of customers is making money, I feel pretty good about that. So, and it's funny, I was um, speaking with a buddy of mine at a really large private equity firm a, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about you know, using CLV as a metric and starting with that as a building block for valuation. And it was funny because uh, he didn't get it. I mean, he, he contended that there are a lot of different factors that are involved in an investment. And um, there are a ton of things involved in making an investment decision between a market and management and all of that. And you had to apply a lot of judgment to an investment decision. And I look at it a little bit differently. He, he admitted, he was like, you know, I'm, I'm at the far <coughs> end of the touchy-feely spectrum. Right? That's, he was like, I'm a little bit um, that way. And admittedly, he also went to HDF, so that's a whole other <laughs> whole other, whole other story. But, you know, at the end of the day, he did sound like those scouts did in Moneyball, right? When they're just sitting around the table and they're thinking, okay, you know, how, you know, does this girl have, does this guy have a good looking girlfriend? All these other factors are involved to picking players. Um, I think you can boil down a lot of this stuff to, to what private equity should evolve into. And I think it is going to be a card counter and statistics oriented uh, business. I think we've seen that in spades in hedge funds and um, things like that because you know uh, they, they've been able to apply a number of different models to the public markets. And I think now is a good time to apply you know, these kinds of statistical analysis and models to the, um, to the private market. And you're able to you know, value businesses better going into it and then grow businesses uh, a lot better when you come out of it. So um, it's really surprising that nobody's doing this, but you know, I think I'm trying to, to, to change things a little bit and hopefully you all will, will take a piece of this as well. Um, and, you know, I think to boil it all down to, you know, if I look at any company, I, I ask three questions, right? How much are their customers worth? How do I maximize their lifetime value? And how do I get more of these best customers? So if you can get that flywheel going, 
I think you can create a really interesting business very quickly. So as we think about you know, using these models to create you know, alpha, I'll call it alpha in, 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 as hedge fund tools, um, there are a number of different characteristics about businesses that can help me predict whether it would be a good investment for me from a private equity side. Right. From, from my perspective, I want to invest in businesses that I can make a lot of change in. And you'll also learn in Pete Bader's class, <coughs> one of the largest disconnects in value is caused by heterogeneity. Right? So if you have customers that are very heterogeneous and some that are you know, worth $2 and some that are worth $100 and they come in different points in time and they're very unpredictable, traditional valuation models will underprice those businesses by 90%, right? So for me, I look at that's opportunity, right? Somebody else is thinking that it's worth 100 bucks. I'm saying it's worth 900, right? So I will go in and, and, and say, okay, figure it out. Uh, can I create that value from what is existingly there? So heterogeneity is one thing I always look at. Second is companies that treat all of their customers the same. So if you treat all of your customers the same, <coughs> it is going to be hard to supercharge those. You've got to find the best customers and do right by those best customers. Treat the rest of them as a cash cow and don't, you know, don't do, do anything to upset the apple cart, but really go out to figure out what are your best customers want and what they, they, they want to do. So if a company is not doing that, I also see opportunity. <coughs> Third is they don't know where uh, a company that's not run well doesn't know where their best uh, customers are coming from. And for me, that's a big deal. Right? If I can figure out customer lifetime value by channel, I find the best channel and I acquire more of those customers. So I think that's um, those are the top three things that I really, really look for in a, in a new business. So it's, it's knowing the past, looking at, at the company and figuring out, okay, these are the things that I can work with, these are the things I know they're doing badly, and these are the things I can improve upon. And then it's to immediately go in and optimize the present, figure out, okay, where are the best channels that I should go after for my customers? What is, um, where are they spending too much on cost to support these customers? What are the possible units? All of those things. Um, and, and figure out what is the best way to run the business currently. And then lastly, it's predict the future. You know, one of the things that I think big data and being <coughs> able to get a lot of custom, you know, customer information provides is it gives you the opportunity <coughs> to run a ton of simulations. Then, interestingly enough, no one in private equity right now is are running tons of simulations and running simulations on a granular level. So I think you know, this, is, this is really where um, you know, folks should be headed in thinking about, okay, how can I affect an outcome of, um, of an investment? <coughs> I can analyze a ton of data, which should be able to tell me and help me better predict what this company is going to be like. So that was all I really had as far as the prepared thing. <coughs> I'm certainly happy to take questions, and um, you know, we can kind of take it from there. Um, how do you define these cohorts? Are they different <coughs> segments, or what exactly are they? So, from a cohort analysis, I generally look at time. Okay, so actually, it's, it's two dimensions: time and channel. So, um, in each each cohort, you have a certain you know time equals zero. These are all the customers that came in at that time, right? And I, I monitor it. Also, I monitor those cohorts by channel to say, okay, over time, which are the most profitable channels or not. And at the end of the day, you really want to capitalize on the ones that obviously <coughs> are the most profitable for the best channel. Sure. <coughs> Can you give us a, a walk through an example where you've now gone through this cohort analysis, how it looks, how you apply it, so, so that we understand better the framework and how you apply that successfully? Yeah, so it's um, it's all happening in real time actually now. So I, we, I've got probably four or five of my portfolio companies 
actually using a number of models that were developed here at Wharton, which is actually pretty neat, right? Our, our concept that, 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 that Pete has been working on for, uh, Professor Fraser has been working on for 25 years. And it's remarkable to see um, how true a lot of the analysis is. And I think that's been a, a terrific aha moment for me in that, um, you know, if I were to look at a, um, a traditional, a traditional um, decay curve of a subscriber base. So if this is, you know, um, <coughs> retention and this is time, uh, it generally looks like this, right? The naive way of doing it would be to say it's a geographic decay, right? So I'm losing 3% of my customers every time period. I'm losing 3% of my customers every week or something like that, right? And it looks like this, right? <coughs> Which doesn't do a very good job predicting what the customer looks like over time. And in fact, with Pete's work, he's figured out that it's an SVG shifted beta geometric formula that fits the curve a lot better. Now, can I take that and I can say, <coughs> okay, well, I can predict with better certainty what that profitability per customer is going to be because of Pete's work, great, right? And I've got an edge versus, versus everybody else who's doing it like this. You know, I, I'll blow that Harvard Business School guy out of the water, right? I, it's very, it's, 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 it's really interesting how much of a difference it makes. So, yeah, I mean, I, there are probably four companies that we're, we're working on now that this is the basis for. Now, if I have a good understanding of what my retention and customer profitability is, I have a better understanding of what I can spend to acquire that customer. So, it, it kind of fulfills itself. <coughs> and it helps me see value where other people don't see value. In the way you approach CLV is different for a continuity business and a one-time customer business. Yeah. So there are two. There, there are absolutely two different kinds of, of, of valuation methods. So in the continuity business, it's going to be your SVG formula, right? In a non-continuity business, you know, this goes back to recency and frequency and being able to model model recency and frequency by product. I mean, the decay curve in a <coughs> continuity business, you really do know you know, whether that customer is alive or dead, right? In a non-contractual business, you don't. So there's different formulas that you apply to a non-contractual business versus a contractual business. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, when you say go after the good customer, the theory is that though there'll be very few of them, so now you kind of reduce what might be a very big market to like a very small market. Does that like figure into what you think the total market size is <coughs> So you get for that when you're doing valuation? Yeah, I think you know market sizing is, is a is a question about everything, and I think that there is a intuitive approach to market size. Um, yeah, I look at I look at funny it, it, that the diet business is sprinkle. It was initially called sprinkle thin, so you sprinkle on your food and you get thin. Um, <laughs> and that business right now they've grown from zero to over two hundred million dollars in revenue in three years. And they have a millionaire matchmaker woman as their coke person and all of this stuff. Um, I look at that. The diet market is a massive market, right? So that kind of helps. Mass, um, you know, uh, if you're to start at it, a good market lists all those. So if the market is growing and it's, it's a big market, you know, that's a, a good place to start. Now, I think all of this stuff kind of assumes you have a good market. You know, if you have a market of one or two people, it, it, you, you, the, the unit economics eventually are not going to work, which is why the, the constant <coughs> optimization really matters. But to your point, market size matters. It doesn't, um, it, it plays into an over umbrella picture in investing, but not so much in the unit economics. Sure. When it comes to uh, assessing prospective VC investments, it, it seems like this might be as, um, or CLV might be kind of as manipulable as more traditional metrics like EBITDA, and then yeah. revenue side, just you know, conjecture and then cost, and that's what, what, what's attributable. And that's why I was wondering if you could kind of speak to some of the challenges there, maybe how you've applied this in 
Yeah. Is the best one. So I think it's it's been interesting on the venture side. I think this is less applicable, right? You need companies to have reached some significant size in order to analyze the history of them, right? Um, on the private equity side, it's a lot it's a lot more applicable because if you I, I like to look at companies between somewhere uh, fifty to hundred million dollars in revenue, right? Because at the end of the day, I can see a company growing from fifty to five hundred. Um, it's hard for me to go from like you know one to five hundred, right? Or I can go I can go from like you know, it, and I think the the I can understand you saying that they're manipulable. I think that's where, from from my perspective, on the due diligence of the companies that we've applied this to, we take the manipulation out of it in that we get the data file, the customer data file, and I've got customers by transaction, by amount. By recency, by frequency, when they de- and then I, we do the analysis, right? And so that kind of takes out, at least on the on the revenue side. Okay, what what do I really think the customer lifetime value on the revenue side is? And then we can go in <coughs> with some forensic accountants and do the do the, the cost side. But if you get to the revenue side first, and I'm still interested in it, then we'll bring in other folks. Does that help answer your question? You mentioned that EBITDA you thought was a little antiquated in terms of valuing the companies and CLV is a more fundamental metric, but what do you, what do you value CLV then? Do you value a couple times CLV? How, how do you think about CLV? So CLV, I look at it actually the summation of particular customer base. So this is the way I look at it. Um, at a point in time, let's say you're Netflix, right? Netflix has at this point in time, I don't know, a uh, couple hundred thousand subscribers. Right? And at that point in time, if I were to say stop and I run off all those subscribers, what's that worth? Right? So that's worth a certain amount. Right? Second is they've already built an engine by which they could acquire more customers. Right? The model add out. <coughs> figure out how much, um, how much those customers can generate in revenue over time. And at the end of the day, it comes back to one valuation number, and that's a summation of all of them. That make sense? Uh, presumably, if the CLV is helping you unlock hidden value when you're buying businesses, you're saying it's allowing you to see that businesses are worth more than maybe other bidders think. I, I imagine it's an obstacle on the back end when you're selling businesses trying to apply these type of techniques to what you think a company is worth. You have a regular way, a private equity investor that's using normal techniques. So how do you kind of, is it an education process or how do you kind of find buyers for your businesses when you're looking at them? Right? So, good question. Um, my view is to go in and actually operate the business with these high, um, with these high, uh, uh, with that as a, as a fundamental metric. So at the end of the day, it'll all come out in the wash through profitability and EBITDA and or growth that shows that this is a, you know, this company is doing better than, um, than it was before. So it will be either growing a ton faster, or it, by the time I do sell it, it will be generating a lot more EBITDA because we've been focusing on these unit economic metrics. Make sense? Yeah. Sure. Do you still use the traditional models? I don't use any DCF at all. No, no, no. I hate DCF. Um, I mean, I think I all, you know, back again about some multiple analysis that I'll work on, but I think I, I don't use DCF at all. Uh, I guess can you I guess then help break down how you're thinking about cost of calculation of lifetime value in terms of the fact that you do need to discount the, the future cash flows of the customer. Yeah, I mean I think you you similarly would apply a discount rate as you would a DCF, and at the end of the day that is fungible, right? It depends on what your cost of capital is, and you build it into your WAC, and you 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 know you run it back. Um, it's I would say it's somewhat similar to doing that kind of analysis on, a, on the DCF front, but it's, it's still going to be a lack at the end of the day because you're, you're putting out capital expenditure at some cost of capital that at the end of the day needs to come back at a certain you know, discount. And your, and your cost of equity would be kind of commensurate with your targeted IRR? Or targeted, targeted IRR. Yeah. I mean, but at, at the end of the day, though, the, being able to discount it back doesn't really play into my thinking as much. Right? 
if I see a company going 100% year over year, or I can make a company that takes 10% <coughs> go 50% year over year, that's where, you know, by applying these methods, that's where I'd, I really would rather focus on. And then, you know, you know, back uh, and operating it that way versus doing the theoretical stuff of discounting the cash flow gap. Yeah, I fully understand the future. I guess the question was more how, how, how do I argue what to pay now and how do I decide the intrinsic value for today? Yeah, so that, yeah, good question. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it is a analysis of looking at what is the runoff rate of the current customers, and that's the base amount, right? I mean, I think, you know, if you can get that for what the value is the company, you're getting the company essentially for free, right? And then you can layer on what you think it's going to be able to do going forward, and you build that into your valuation. At the end of the day, you know, you're, it's always, always a bid and the ask, and whether you can get the bid and the ask <coughs> to, ma to match, you know, that's where you can get a deal that way. Talk a little bit more about Virgin and how you apply these concepts to that business early on and in okay. particular how you got that $2 um, user acquisition method or if that was kind of a phenomenon. So, yeah. Um, so, Virgin was, was this company that I started with my wife, actually. So, it was, it was me and her. We, it was not the smartest thing to do. We were married for like six months. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up starting a business together. And um, Virgin was... Uh, <coughs> it was in the you know local services space. So this was you know call it beginning of 2010. Groupon and all those businesses were, were were all up and to the right. And so a buddy of mine was actually president of Groupon. So we, we sat and we talked a little bit. And we had a, a, a unwritten understanding of you know we could segment, segment the market. We would take the high end of the range, and they would take kind of the, the more mass end of the range. And um, that's that's kind of how the idea got started, right? So we were we were doing um, you know health and beauty, food and beverage, beverage, lifestyle kind of categories in initially San Francisco uh, when we launched in March, and then we launched in June in LA. Now we were acquiring customers so cheaply, largely because of the category, right? We were we were first to market in this kind of a business. We kind of looked at it like all of our friends. Um, uh, like like good stuff, and they would like good stuff at a, at a better price, but they wouldn't buy the stuff on Groupon. So that's kind of what drove our customer base. Looks like you know they're like all of you, know, you guys. And second was um, uh, we had a, a very large viral component to it. So this was when refer a friend was still really hot, and we had a significant social um, component to it. So we were able to acquire customers for very cheaply. So as an example, when we first started the business, we were, we were acquiring customers um, for $2 a sub um, in March. And then uh, by the time we sold the business in October, prices had gone up from 2 to 5 right? And if you talk to anybody now, if you talk to Guild Group, et cetera, their customer acquisitions are multiples of that 5 even. So, you know, you'll, you'll see, and that is a very important part of customer lifetime value, and why you continually have to monitor it, is your, your customer acquisition costs are very dynamic, and they can change over time, and you have to come up with better, better ways to do it. Um, so, if I understood you correctly, you described how in your portfolio company it would be almost like implementing a, 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 an ongoing process rather than a one-off, you know, remodel or so. Yeah. So, what other effects do you think that has on, you know, may that be the organizational structures, the kind of decision makers you want in there, anything? Awesome, awesome question. At the end of the day, <coughs> applying this kind of attitude and this customer centricity is a highly um, involved process where you focus on people, process, and the culture, right? You really have got to change that in the business to be able to focus on this, this unit economic because, and I think that's, it's actually a great way to do it because if you were to, to rally the whole company behind one specific metric, it's actually pretty good, right? You can feel pretty good about, um, you can feel, feel pretty good about that. So um, a lot of things need to change. Um, ultimately over time. In the two companies that I invested in that, that, that I showed as examples, um, they lived and breathed it. 
everybody lives in Visa. Um, and so you have to, if it's not innate in the company, you need to make it innate in the company. Typically, when you have uh, smaller companies and startup companies, uh, you need to worry more about budget, and, and you do have to look about like business plan and uh, PCF. Uh, you can't really look only at on. Yes and no. I, I mean, I would say, as a startup company, don't waste your time doing a PCF. In my opinion, <laughs> right? You, oh, yeah. I do an operating budget and figure <coughs> out. Yeah. yeah, you have to budget and figure out what to, what to do. Um, if you're able to show profitable growth relatively quickly, you will find investors that will back up that. So at the end of the day, in the intelligent beauty company, um, <coughs> I ended up using, and my firm ended up putting close to um, $100 million in that business. So the first check, <coughs> first check was actually 12 and a half, second check was actually 20, and then after that, there was a $50 million check and then a $40 million check. So we had, you know, because the company was doing so well, you can get money to grow it, right? And I think that's kind of the mentality. You have to you have to ride the third rail a little bit, but you know, um, you need to show that growth, or else you're, you're if you show the growth and profitability, you'll be able to get capital to fund it. Does that make sense? And if you can boil it down to, I mean, the CEO of that company is very simple. He's like, if I can get a two x ROI on my marketing dollar, I will spend every dollar. And he's, because I know I'm going to get 2x back. So why not spend every dollar? So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach market sizing and also forecasting market share growth? I don't. <laughs> I don't forecast market share growth. I mean, at the end of the day, <coughs> um, I think about it kind of intangibly. Is it a big market? Right? Is the health, is the health product market a big market? Is the um, diet market a big market? Is the shoe market a big market? Right? I know my wife. The shoe market is a big market. <laughs> um, I, you know, if I look at consumer finance, that's a big market. So if I can say, as an example, think finance plays in a $70 billion consumer finance market right, for their asset class. That's big enough for me. right? And they're doing $500 million of the $70 billion, still a ton more room to grow. Um, so if you have a, a, a massive market, that's a pretty easy, a good start. The unit economics of businesses are likely to change over time. So yeah. when you're underwriting CLD, how do you think about forecasting those assumptions? Absolutely. It's largely in the form of customer acquisition costs, right? Because you can control the revenue side of it. Then you need certain aspects of um, customer acquisition costs. And that, that's a little bit of some intangibles, but you bake that into your equation. You assume that customer acquisition costs are going to grow at a certain rate over time. And there's some experience that, are, that that's involved in it. Um, so in my book, the, the Intelligent Beauty Company, the chief marketing officer for that business actually just last year got recruited to Guilt Group, and she's now the chief marketing officer at Guilt Group. And she lives and breathes customer acquisition and understanding what the cost per channel is. So, you know, you, you kind of work with them to be able to understand, okay, how, how, how do you see customer acquisition costs growing or changing over time? Right. But it's a very dynamic part of the equation. <laughs> it's pretty difficult to actually measure your, you know, the effectiveness of your marketing spend at times. So yeah. I think some of, the, some of the you know new media allows you to track customer ac acquisition pretty accurately, but you know, how do you know if you buy a TV advertisement you're actually... Great, great question. I mean, I think that's one of the things... Um, from a traditional retailer perspective, so if I'm the general public, you know, it's hard to apply these customer lifetime initiatives because you can't track them, right? You can't track how you got those customers. Uh, in e-commerce, you can track those incredibly granularly. So, you know, my wide world is e-commerce and internet investing, and so that's why this really appeals to me in being able to track those things. It's really hard. Now, folks do it on TV to say, look, you know, there's a, there's a code and a promotion that you can, you know, plug in when you buy or, you know, mention this when you come into the store. Those are generally hard to track, but that is, if you can come up with the answer to that, that is, I mean, what was the adage? You know, um, uh, what is it? 50% of my marketing is wasted. I just don't know if it's which 50%. So if you can track that much, you have a job anywhere you want. 
<laughs> you build your own company, better yet. And I think we have time for about three more questions. Okay. Does anybody have anything else? Sure. Uh, how would you deal with mature companies where, uh, you know, retention and so the, the, the customers they lose, roughly the customers they gain, and uh, what are the differences versus <coughs> one of these that are scoring so much? Right. Actually, a mature company or, or comp I would actually say it this way. A company that's flatlined, I think, is pretty exciting. Right? Because that means that I, that's, uh, they're not going to, one, expect a, ton, a huge valuation because they're, they're not growing. And two, um, if I can figure out how to get this on a growth trajectory, I'm happy to, I'm excited to do it, right? Um, so I look at companies that are flatlined very similarly, right? Are they optimizing their marketing budget? Are they optimizing their marketing channel? Are they getting them, are they profitably, you know, um, working with their customers going forward? If I can answer, if, if the answer is no to a lot of those, then there's, I think, opportunity <coughs> to buy it. And better yet, you can buy it at a cheap price. Um, I'm not sure it's too granular, but a question on cohort analysis. Do you have insight on <coughs> analyzing cohorts when the actual consumers are inconsistent in their buying patterns? So I, I was trying to do analysis for independent orthodontists buying orthodontic products. Some would buy a full inventory for a year, every other year or every year, and then others would buy monthly. So comparing the and calculating customer right. value in that context. So that, that goes back to the contractual, non-contractual part. Sure. So uh, that, you know, an orthodontist buying, buying supplies is non-contractual. So, you know, there are different equations that figure out, okay, who, um, and this is actually, if you haven't taken Pete's class, there's, there's one segment of it that focuses particularly on non-contractual. Um, but you, you would model it out based on recency and frequency and how recently somebody purchased and how frequently they have. And some metrics trump others. And surprisingly, what comes out in the output, um, your hot best customers um, may, aren't as intuitive as you thought they were. Okay. Great. Uh, one last question? Sure. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you say that COV is different for uh, different acquisition channels. Uh, from your perspective, uh, which uh, acquisition channel do you raise price? It's completely different depending on the uh, depending on the um, business. So, as an example, in the in Think Finance, they're initially their online channel, um, display advertising, that's ROI. Right? That's eroded over time, and now direct mail is actually their best advertising channel. Um, so it, it, it changes over time, which is why it needs to be dynamic. Um, and I guess, you know, there's, there's no way to really say, you know, social. I would say social, unfortunately, has been one of the bigger disappointments. Facebook ads haven't converted as well as a lot of other media. Great. Well, um, thanks, everyone, for making the trek over from uh, JMHH to here.